So I have to admit that, uh, <clears throat> I don't know, this series hasn't done quite what I expected or wanted it to do. You know, we're talking about this concept of desiring God for God's sake, not for what he can do for you, not because of the benefits, not because that's what I was taught, not because that's my duty, just this concept that is in scripture that is foreign to many of us of going, man, there is this place of just desiring God. And I warned us that these are big shoes that we're trying to fit our little tiny feet into. And I don't know whether I just haven't done a good enough job or it's just, it's, it's stretching us. It's a new thing. And so we're, we're just trying to decide what to do with this, but I need to disappoint you up front. I have no solutions for you today. We're fixing nothing, right? Because that's what a speech should do. That's what a sermon should do. I, we, we identify a problem and we go, this fixes it. If you would just do X, Y, and Z, this would be better, right? That's, we love that because we're a self-help society. We want to know a problem and we want to know the solution. And I'm going to terribly disappoint you today. Don't have it. Not the way that we're going with this. We want to look one last time at this concept of desiring God. And we're going to start with a very famous passage, at least the first part of it. If you've been in church at all for any length of days or back in the old days, you will know this. This is a very famous uh, chorus is written after this. This is Psalms 42. As the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God. Not for his blessings, not for him to fix my things in my life, not to give me a community of faith. I thirst for God, for the living God, and all I ask is when can I go and meet with God? Do you know how profound of a concept this is for us? This is why I'm willing to risk this. We need to press on. We might not get there. This might be really far off from you. You might not even go, I'm not sure I can ever get there. I'm not even sure I want to get there. And yet there's this invitation in scripture of going, my soul can thirst for God. Have you ever really been thirsty? I don't know if you can be thirsty in Pennsylvania. I lived in California. It, it, you know, so you can go without water and get thirsty here. <clears throat> but until you live in like 15% humidity and it's 110 degrees out, like there's a new level of thirst that just kind of, because like it dries your body up. You, you are looking for trees. It's great. You go to the parking lot, every tree is parked under. Like, because nobody wants to be out in that sun. No one wants to get in that hot car. Nobody wants to feel that kind of that unrelenting sun. That was one of the hardest things out there. That's why I eventually left California. I was just like, I just can't take this much sun. Like, it comes out in like the end of May, and it doesn't go away until November. I'm telling you seriously, there's not like a cloud in the sky. And it was just like oppressive of going, if you could give me one rainy day and one cloudy day, I could have made it. But nope, I'm going back to Pennsylvania. I need some relief. And so when the psalmist uh, mentions this, we often think of kind of like the Pennsylvania woods. They didn't have Pennsylvania woods in Israel. They were an arid area. It's like California. It's hot. It's dry. There aren't a lot of trees. And so for an animal, for a, for a deer looking for relief, I've been under this excruciating sun and I'm thirsty. In one sense, my life depends on this. I've got to find that stream of water. My life depends on this. It's not just kind of quenching something. It is my life depends on this. Do you really get to God like that? I need God. I need him for my life. I am absolutely and utterly desperate for him. And one of the things that we've learned through this series is that this is not just kind of floating out there. 
this, this concept of desiring God as much as it's put into the context of, of a desiring over something else. And so we've seen this desiring over the disappointments of life. Almost being angry at God. Why haven't you fixed this stuff? Why do you tolerate this stuff? Why aren't you delivering on your promises? And yet we are called to go, whom in heaven do I have but you? My soul desires you alone. We put it over the sin that we chase, the pleasures that we chase, the things that satisfy us. We are a culture, and this is the sin, the first sin of America, is that we prioritize what I want and my pleasure above everything else. And even when it's not even a sin, even when it's not wrong, scripture goes, there's a greater desire. Better is one day, one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be the furthest piece of person in your kingdom than to ever live in the land where I get everything I want. This place of desire. And so we look at this, Psalms 42, my soul thirsts for God. I don't know how you're processing this. I don't know what you're doing with this, but it's an invitation, a stark invitation. And we can look at this and go, wow, what a religious, we should make a song after that. And we did, right? You know, as the deer path of four, right? We know that if you've been in church. What's amazing about this statement is what happens next. Isn't that how we have been seeing it in these Psalms? It starts with this kind of this statement of desire and then life kicks in. So we have this beautiful sentiment. We use these verses to create a song and we stop there because we don't want verse three. It doesn't make any song. You ready for it? My tears, I've desired you like water, but my tears, in fact, have been my food all day and night. And the people around me are saying, where is your God? Why haven't things changed? What good is your faith? What does it matter? You're a fool to think and believe these things. Why are you wasting your time? Don't even talk to me about this. Look at you, you're a mess. Your life is a mess. And they sit there. Oh. Such a stark contrast. He goes on. He says, all right, that's where I'm at. Tears and, and uh, crying and sadness. And so, you know, he kind of does the American thing. I'm going to pull myself up by my bootstraps, right? I'm going to deal with myself and I just messed this all up. Can you get me back so I don't cry all day and night? Thank you. These things I remember as I'm pouring out my soul. You notice this, that he doesn't hold back. Like there is no faith here where it's, we hide our doubts and our problems away from God. We, go, we pursue him. That's part of the desiring God. We don't, uh, we don't walk into him going, everything is perfect and that's the only time I can desire God. I pour out my sorrow when everything is wrong. And I remember how I used to go to God's house. There was a time when I was filled with joy. And I had spiritual vitality. I can remember those days, but today is not it. Today I'm broken. Today I don't have it. Today I don't even know how I can conceive a feeling that way again. But I remember. I remember. Today I'm lost. And so why, my soul, are you downcast? Why are you so disturbed within me? One of the things that we don't talk a lot about in church is mental and emotional health. Just kind of, you know, see, that's where we stay on that solution side, right? Well, if you do X, Y, and Z, you'll always be happy. And if you're happy and you know it, stomp your feet, right? I'll clap your hands. Christianity is supposed to fix my emotions. Christianity is supposed to make me happy. And here we have this thing here where it's not he's complaining about what's wrong out there. He's not complaining about uh, going, hey, I don't want to live in the tents of the wicked. He goes, man, the problem's inside me. 
I am broken down. I am downcast. I am disturbed. And I don't even know what to do with myself. I don't know how I got here. I don't know what to do about it. I can't just kind of choose my way out of this. We don't like to talk about that, church. Right? And, and, and we embrace the second part of this verse. Put your hope in God. Right? This sounds like a sermon. Right? You come in. Like, this is a call and response. You do the first part. My part is, put your hope in God and let's sing some songs to God my Savior. And it will be all okay. And I send you out the door going, hope, I hope the medicine worked. And it's not even to the, you get to the car that you're going. Yeah. Maybe it's worked for some of you. Maybe it hasn't worked for all of you. Right? This is... This is this is the right version, right? We identify a problem and I gave you the solution. Hey, I just need to give you a buck up talk here. Put your hope in God. And certainly I could build a ginormous case here out of the rest of scripture of how going, what? What's one of the most common commands in scripture? Do not fear. Don't be anxious. Don't be worried about your life. Don't be, like there's a whole case in Christianity out of scripture that kind of goes right against this. That says, you know what, there's something about this faith that, yeah, it does steal you. It does make you stronger emotionally and mentally. That you can kind of go at this world and you're going, you know what, I can take it. And I can deal with it because I've got this hope that's, that, that I have and it gives me strength. And we love those sermons. because it's and, and they're right. They are right because they're all throughout and we'll even push the envelope to the point where we go, you know what? And if you aren't fixing it, then the problem is you, don't we? Whether we say it out loud or not, that's where the church is left. You had better get your act together. The Bible gives you all the tools, all the faith is there. And so if you can't pull this together, Obviously, you are deficient. I mean, good night. Here's the answer, right? And yet, this is not the end of the psalm. I want you to take this daring ride that scripture takes us on. I want to blow open some, some categories for you that puts Christianity in this nice, neat little category of problem solution. There are those things, but there is more than that. And your faith is smaller until you start wrestling with all of God's truth. Right? So, okay, he's asked the question. He's got the answer. Fix it. Right? Now watch what he says. My soul is downcast though within me. He goes right back to it. I'm going to try and remember. I'm going to pull myself up by bootstraps. I'm going to remember of the good places in my life. You know, we're not going to get into all the details of this, but just kind of like, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to go back to my good memories. Maybe it was at home. Maybe it was during high school. Maybe it was at college or, or some point in your life, you're just going to kind of go, I remember when it was good. Right? Verse six, I'm trying to pull myself out. And look what he does. Ah, but deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. Now, this is really strange, and a lot of people wrestle with what exactly this means. It's the second part that's important. Remember, he was desiring God, thirsting for God. When he comes to his waterfalls, what do they do to them? Your waves and your breaks, they just sweep right over me. I am tossed aside. This is not a statement of faith. This is a statement of going, man, I am downcast. I've tried the positive thinking method. I've tried to remember good times. And when I even find your water, it breaks me up. I'm undone. Ah, but he's got to go back to faith here, right? Uh, but okay, okay, I got I to gotta do, do the church answer. But by day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is within me. It is my prayer to God, to the God of my life, right? Oh, okay, he got the answer. He fixed it. Verse nine, 
And then I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? Are you catching this? There's no solution, fixed it, problem, solution, fixed it, go home, we're all done. Like he's already cited the solution in one sense. And then he goes back and forth. Oh, faith. Oh, despair. And he comes right back to where we began. Why, my soul, are you down against? Why am I all busted up inside? Why can't I feel right? Why can't I be right? Yeah, nobody's making a song out of that, are they? We're going to stay nice and safe with verse 1 and 2. This is a raw type of faith, isn't it? I hope it's blowing your mind up. Because here it is, out in the open. Everything doesn't quite get fixed nice and neat. There's a lot of times in scripture it does work out. Here is one psalm, it does not. And he wrestles and he recognizes it. And I don't really understand why this should be that earth shaking to us. When we look through history, Christian history, this is exactly what we find. Yeah, we find a lot of overcomers. We find a lot of victorious people. We have people, you pulled me out of the darkness, out of the miry clay. You set my feet on the rock. You opened up my soul. I live in joy. I live in victory. Yeah, we got a lot of that. Then when we have people like Martin Luther, right? He changed Christianity. A man that wrestled with depression all of his life. When I first entered the monastery, this is a quote from him, from his journals. When I first entered the monastery, it came to pass that I was sad and downcast. And nor could I lay aside my melancholy. On this account, I made confession to, you know, I confessed it. And I took counsel with uh, one, of, one of the leaders there and opened up to him what horrible and terrible thoughts I had. And he said to me, don't you know, Martin, that this temptation is useful and necessary to you. God does not exercise you this. He doesn't put you through this without reason. You will see that he intends to use this as a, use you as his servant to accomplish great things. He confessed at the beginning of his, of his ministry thing. He dealt with it so much through his life that became a recurring thought in his journals and his teachings to later pastors. He would talk about, okay, here's how you deal with depression. They didn't use the word depression, they used melancholy, but we get it. It seems depression was just as common then as it is now. But at the core of Luther's advice was always that we are free to hand over our pain and our sin and our abilities to Savior, but not always to be rescued. All right, well, that's, that's a pretty old guy. He just didn't know a lot. Let's come into uh, later times. William Cowper, you don't know him. I didn't know him at all. He was a man that uh, had a terrible childhood. He lost his mom when he was five. Uh, he was sick a lot. Um, he was bullied terribly. Um, he had a stepmom that didn't treat him very well. He, had a, he, just, he was a fragile human being. He went to study law and he dropped out. You know why? Because he seized up on the test. Gee, do we talk about that nowadays? It's not, not, not that he didn't know. He just couldn't handle the pressure. He actually had to be institutionalized. It stressed him out so much. He eventually moved to a church, got, got saved, introduced, you know, met with God and uh, became a Christian, moved to a church, and that church was run by 
uh, uh, I just lost his name, John. John's somebody really important. He's really important because he's the one that wrote Amazing Grace. John Newton, there we go, thanks. John Newton. It turns out that William was a poet and John Newton and him wrote hymns together, even out of his despair. In fact, they went, that was part of John's pastoring of him. It was going, hey, let me keep you on the right path. Let me keep you focused on things. But he wrote often about his despair. He wrote songs of his wrestling. They put together a very famous hymnal that was used throughout uh, Christendom at that time. Now, he was used all these ways, all this talent, but he wrestled hard. In fact, he wrestled so hard when he was at the end of his life, he wrote one other hymn that talked about how he was damned because he just, you know, the melancholy would overcome him and he just was like, I don't know how God could ever love me. I don't know how I ever, I can't be made right. And yet he, he wrote so many beautiful things about how God's grace filled up his life. Yeah, he was a girly man. That's what's his problem. How about Charles Spurgeon? You might know him. He's a famous preacher. He was a man's man. He was big. He was strong. He was a powerful preacher. He had, he had a great sense of humor. He even smoked cigars. He was so much of a man. He wasn't a good Methodist, but he was a good man. Right? Like a manly man. He was very successful early on. In his early 20s, he already had a packed full church because he was such a great preacher. And then a tragedy happened. An accident happened and multiple people died in the service. There was a stampede. And it broke him emotionally. His wife said, my beloved's anguish was so deep and violent that his reason seemed to totter on his throne. And we sometimes feared that he would never preach again. By the time he was 33, he had a whole lot of physical ailments and that put him down and he wasn't seeing victory there. His critics would pound him for it. It says the depression could hit him so intensely that he once said, I could say with Job from the Bible, my soul would choose strangling rather than life. I would rather, I could readily enough have laid violent hands upon myself to escape the misery of the spirit. That's a great speaker, that's a great pastor. Like his books are still in print today. Could you imagine that? In his later years, he had a, a, a whole lecturing thing about the minister's fainting fits. Because he went, you know what? I want you young guys to know that when this comes, it's not a weird thing. And when you can't have victory over it easily, I want you to know that God's grace is enough. And I want you to know that someone who has stood in the sunlight of success has also stood in the shadows. Yeah. So I don't have a three-step process for you to go, this is how you get out of depression. As much as a recognition that there is a place of wrestling in scripture, in history. I mean, this shouldn't be a surprise us. We could name people in the Bible. Elijah was a great prophet did great things. He struggled with depression. Obviously, Job and all of the things he went through. Jeremiah, known as the weeping prophet. What do we do with this? Hey, put your hope in God. Go home and fix it. I love Psalm 103. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we were formed. And he remembers that we are but dust. It's 
the world that says, boy, you can overcome anything with your mind. If you put your will to it and you use the right technique, we go, we are but dust and we are fragile. And even with our grand faith and our great God, there are things that are not going to be fixed in this world. And so, maybe we need to see the beginning of the psalm in the new lights. Not three easy steps, and this is how you fix your heart. This is how you fix your emotions. As much as to go in the deepest valleys, when all the water has dried up, when you are lost in the shadows, The rescue is not that that goes away. The rescue is that my soul thirsts for God. Isn't that what this series is about? I don't have, I can't fix everything. God doesn't fix everything now. There will be disappointments and we're invited into desiring him. There will be plenty of choices and pleasures. He goes, will you desire me? And even when you yourself fail and you cannot escape, he says even then, will you desire me? Big shoes. That's what I'm, the invitation is here, folks. So we're gonna we're gonna sing, uh, but I want to give some time. Take this before God. I don't know where you're at. I don't, I don't know where this is like right on the edge, just as far away from you. We're gonna have some people on the two ends. I'm gonna have even somebody in the back. So if you're kind of a little bit shy, you can you can pray in the back with a little more confidentiality. Certainly you can pray in the seats, the altars are open, but man, can we, can we imagine a place where you go, man, I desire God, like my life depends on it. Come and pray.